There are few places where leadership matters more than in the conflict between nations and within states. The paradoxes of different human needs, values and ideologies, the competition for scarce resources and the influence of other regions to gain power make for the most complex challenges a leader could face. In this show, we talk to Emma Skye, who has advised leaders in some of the world's most critical crises and war zones over the past 25 years. Today, she heads Yale University's International Leadership Center. What can every leader learn from managing in the storm? So welcome to The Evolving Leader, the show born from the belief that we need deeper, more committed and more human leadership to confront the world's biggest challenges. I'm John Gomes, co-host of the show, along with Emma Sinclair. Emma, how are you feeling today? Thanks, John. I am feeling, I'm feeling very content. It's been a good week, made a lot of progress, so I'm feeling a good sense of satisfaction. Also feeling quite energised, which is uh, quite unlike me on uh, on an afternoon. Um, but I also have a slight nervous anticipation for our guest today. I'm quite excited to be, uh, be able to spend some time here. Uh, how are you feeling, John? I am feeling um, a torn, actually. I am feeling uh, very wired. I think that's in part the anticipation of tomorrow with the England Women's World Cup. Um, and yeah i yeah I always feel uh, that kind of edgy feeling of really wanting it to to watch it and then you know sort of like that that horrible feeling if it all goes horribly wrong but anyway um but I have a sense of adventure um in learning about the lessons that our guest today has had given her extraordinary experience and ringsight seat at some of the world's most important events in the last twenty or so years. Because today we're joined, and we're delighted to be joined by Emma Skye, who is the founding director of Yale's International Leadership Centre. She is a guest lecturer at Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs, where she teaches great power, competition, cooperation, global affairs, grand strategy, and refugees and Middle East politics. She is the author of the highly acclaimed The Unraveling, High Hopes and Missed Opportunities in Iraq, and In a Time of Monsters, Travelling in the Middle East, in revolt. She served as a political advisor to a number of very high profile leaders, including the Commander General of US forces in Iraq, as development advisor to the commander of NATO's International Security Assistant Force in Afghanistan, as political advisor to the US Security Coordinator for the Middle East uh, Peace Process, and as government coordinator in Kirkuk for the Coalition Provisional Authority. And she's also worked in the Palestinian territories for a decade managing projects to develop Palestinian institutions and promoting coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. So Emma, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thank you very much. How are you feeling today, Emma? Well, I'm feeling a bit mixed emotions. It's my last week in London before I go back to America for the start of the new semester. So I've been busy seeing friends here and students and fellows and that's all lovely, and I'm, I'm sad to go. So, Emma, imagine we're at a dinner party, and, um, and it's a load of people who don't operate in the political or academic worlds that you're so steeped in. And I ask you what you do. Um, how do you get into this conversation? What would you tell me? Well, I focus on developing leaders who are committed to doing good in the world helping others to building the good society. And I think back to when I was a student and it was a very unique time. I came of age at the end of the Cold War. And it was that era when we felt that all the problems of the world were going to be solved. And I always imagined myself as working in international development and conflict resolution. And I worked in Israel, Palestine and supported the Middle East peace process. I worked in Iraq following the invasion. And I was somebody, my natural instinct was, when there were problems, I wanted to go out and help 
to make things less bad. And after 20 odd years of doing this sort of work, everything I ever worked on really ended in failure. And so since then, I've spent a lot of time reflecting through writing, through talking, through teaching. And I think rather than going out to developing countries to help people fix their problems, I'm now based in a university, Yale University, and I teach, as you mentioned, but also run this leadership center where I scout for international talent, bring people to Yale, and I help build the capacity and networks of mid-career individuals to help them address challenges around the world. So I think that's how I would try and explain it. I think that's a, a wonderful introduction. And um, the way that you mentioned um, reflection and looking back on sort of maybe the former life and what you've taken into um, what you do in Yale now. And I think it's safe to say that you've had a really incredible ringside seat in some of the most significant global events, perhaps in the past 25 years. And it would be great if you could just give us a sense of the experiences perhaps within that that have defined your purpose or your values or identity, perhaps in your career and life to date. I think of my experiences in sort of two main blocks. The first, Israel-Palestine. And, you know, 1993, the Oslo Accords get signed on the White House lawn. And this hope that the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be two states for two peoples. And I moved out to Jerusalem to, you know, I just wanted to find a way to help. And I ended up getting work there managing donor projects to help build up the institutions of Palestinian authority and to help sort of broker relations between Israelis and Palestinians, people-to-people relations. And the prime minister, the Israeli prime minister at that time, Itzhak Rabin, really believed that the future of the Jewish state depended on the flourishing of a Palestinian state. And, you know, he paid for his life with that belief. And I happen to be one of those young people in the square in Tel Aviv, the evening of 4th of November, 1995, at this massive peace rally. And at that rally, sort of 200,000 people came together to sing for peace, express their desires for peace, and he was assassinated. And that sense that before then, I always thought that all it took for evil to conquer is for good people to do nothing. And when this happened, it really struck me that things don't always end well. I think that was my first glimpse of that. And after his assassination, things really began to deteriorate. There were extremists on both sides that went out to try and torpedo the peace process, torpedo the confidence building measures to take it forward, led to the second Intifada. And, you know, you look at the situation today, which is pretty dismal. So I think in the 1990s, there really was this opportunity to end the conflict there. And the opportunity was missed. And today it's a very different, very different case. And the other big experience of my life was 2003 with the Iraq war. And I was somebody who was very much sort of anti-war. And I volunteered to go out there after the invasion to try and help Iraqis rebuild their country. I thought I had some useful experiences from my time working in Israel and Palestine. And I didn't want the only international, the only foreigner that Iraqis met to be a soldier with a gun. So I volunteered to go out there and I didn't know what my job or anything was going to be before I went out. And I found in a very short period of time, I was put in charge of the province, province of Kirkuk. I 
you know, my first week on the job, insurgents came to the house and fired rockets into it. And I was very lucky to survive that. And, you know, I really fell in love with Iraq. I stayed much longer than I ever anticipated. I stayed for years and ended up becoming the political advisor to the top American generals working in Iraq. So it was a big, you know, from sort of anti-war to becoming the political advisor of American generals, it was a, a big change, I suppose, a big transition, a big evolution. I'm absolutely fascinated to try and get a sense of what you do because the, the job and not only are the challenges huge, but the job seems huge as well in these things. And sometimes not very clear, as you just said, you might, you think you're doing one thing, you might be doing something else. So can you give us a sense of what kind of things do you do in, in these roles? What, what is your day, week, month look like? What are you actually, you know, engaged in, in doing? Well, there is no day that is the same. <laughs> There's no such thing as a routine. I suppose the only routine thing was in the morning with the military. It starts with a briefing that everybody attends to try and get everybody on the same sheet of paper. So you would have the generals sitting there for their morning update and people all over the country would do a briefing. So they would brief through, you know, video conference so they would brief and then once everybody had received that briefing listened to the commander's intent commander's feedback that was about the only day part of the day that was routine from then on we would travel all around the country meeting iraqis meeting military meeting all different sorts of people and it would be really, really long days. The days would start about six in the morning and they would finish maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night. So very hardworking, very intensive. And for me, the general wanted me to come with him wherever he went. He wanted me to sort of pre-brief him before his meetings, to be in the meetings with him, to debrief afterwards, to discuss. And he was somebody I met very early on in the war. And later when he was made sort of the general for the surge, he asked me to come back to be his advisor because I brought very different perspectives. And he felt that he'd always thought that military force could solve every problem in the world. And he'd learned after his first deployment there that that was not the case. And so he wanted to have somebody who could tell him, and he wasn't afraid to tell him when he was making mistakes, to tell him, you know, that's really not the right way to go, to be a bouncing board. It's not that I had all the solutions, it's just I had different views. And it was that debate, that bringing that different perspective, that he valued. It's really interesting. So it's a kind of constant improv, improv kind of uh, job as much as anything else. <laughs> You, you've talked about the fact that there, are, um, that sometimes it's easy to think there are technical fixes, and some of those technical fixes come with a set of values that we might be projecting onto the situation. Um, when it's really all about politics, I'm particularly interested in, in who you need to be, because you don't strike me as a politician. But how did how did you manage that um, being that role, that that set of con you know, contra contradictions? It's, I think from, you know, you develop who you are from the different experiences that you have. And I think by the time I got to Iraq, I had had a lot of experiences. You know, as I said, I came of age in that post-Cold War era, which was an era of optimism and a belief that, you know, the problems of the world could be solved. But there was also this belief that there was one road to modernity, and that was through liberal democracy. And there was a belief that there was a recipe for making peace and building states. And you have these different organizations were set up to do that. There were books written about it, new doctrine. But 
you know, it's not like baking a cake. These are the set steps. You do this and out pops peace or out pops institutions. I think I'd spent, you know, I'd hitchhiked on my own across Africa. I had traveled a lot. I didn't really come with a doctrine. I didn't really come with, I suppose, a set way of doing this. I hadn't been trained in a particular way. And I think I focused really on cultivating relationships and building trust and understanding motivations and aspirations. You know, when I was hitchhiking on my own across Africa, my security, my safety was dependent on, not by being the strongest person with a gun, but dependent on building rapport with people I met, sort of building that connection with them. And so I think I had, you know, I'd never been to Iraq before the war, but I had spent time in the Middle East before. And perhaps I had more of an understanding of the structural constraints in which people operate, the politics they have to navigate. And I was kind of a trusted outsider who could help people better articulate what it is they wanted, what their needs were. I could try and help understand the perspective of others and perhaps in my own way sort of nudge people a little bit closer to each other. This is a really fascinating conversation. We, we've got time to expand upon all of these amazing topics that you're kind of opening up. But one of the things that really fascinated is, um, you know, you look at these incredibly volatile situations in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and we think about the concept of power. Um, can you talk to us about what you've learned about power in those situations, how to understand it, how to influence it? I think in Iraq, before the power, before we went to Iraq, power resided in the state and in the president. It was kind of an authoritarian state with a, a strong man leader, Saddam Hussein strong, evil, awful man, but a strong man leader. And what happened when we invaded the state in 2003, we dissolved the security institutions and we dismissed all the civil servants because the thinking was you can't build a new democratic state on foundations which are essentially fascist. You need to build them on new foundations. But instead of just replacing the regime, the unintended consequence of what we did was actually collapsing the state. And in a collapsed state, people grew fearful. They formed militias to protect themselves. There were no security forces to guard the borders, so jihadis came in. And it ended up with this chaos, this mass chaos. And I think that was very hard for us to understand that this was a consequence of a failed state, a collapsed state, in which all these different groups were competing for power. I think I've always really focused on, you know, states that committed humanitarian or human rights abuses. I've never previously seen what happens when a state collapses what happens to ordinary people, how ordinary people behave. And now over the, the years, sort of groups have formed in Iraq and they have become more powerful and they've taken power. But you don't have a centralized state in the same way. And you don't have an authoritarian leader as before, but you have all these different power centers. So in the north of the country, there are Kurdish political parties and they're competing against each other. In the centre and the south, there are Shia, different Shia parties, different Shia Islamist parties, which have got relations with external powers as well. So you see this external interference comes from Iran, is the most sort of powerful country there. And Iraq, Iraq's economy is heavily dependent on oil. So the government doesn't live off the taxes paid from the hard work of its citizens, it gets these oil rents. So you have all of the, the curse 
of oil wealth. It is a rentier state, which sets really perverse incentives for how politicians behave. And so, yes, they have elections in Iraq, but whoever comes to power, they then share the wealth, that all the oil rents between them. You have a kleptocracy and you have large scale corruption. Understanding or mapping all of that is really, is really difficult. What was interesting when I was reading Robert Kaplan's The Tragic Mind recently, I don't know if you've um, read that, but you know, when his kind of reflections obviously born out of a deep kind of depression that he experienced in backing the Iraq war as a journalist and analysis, uh, 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 you know, giving his analysis of why that was right. And this notion that, that these situations are inherently tragic, there is, no, there is no perfect solution to them. They are about managing this competition of, of competing evils. Um, how do you see it, you know, your job in the light of that kind of re reality? Is that, is that something you share in terms of, uh, of a view? You know, it's a very difficult one. I think Robert Kaplan now feels it was the wrong decision to go to Iraq, and he regrets that decision, that in terms of American national interests, it has not left America in a stronger position. Iran is seen as the bigger winner from that war. The American intervention mobilized a generation of jihadis with a vision of caliphate, not of democracy. It made Iran much stronger in the region. It undermined America's global reputation as the global hegemon, and it undermined the image of democracy in the world. But if you ask you know, some Iraqis, they will have a different view on that. And they will say, look, before under Saddam, they couldn't breathe. They had no hope for the future. And even though the last 20 years have led to so much death and so much sadness and so much tragedy, that they can dream of a different future that many of them have better lives than they would have done. Shall we sort of step, a, step aside and, and just look at you know, some of those learnings, lessons, and, and what's going on in the, in the world today, perhaps, and perhaps how some of the big forces are playing out, maybe when we think of globalisation, um, perhaps rolling back to some extent, or maybe the US and China relationships, Ukraine and Africa, what do you see or do you have a sense of what sort of the coming decades going to have and unfold uh, in front of us? What's, what's the picture currently painting for you at the moment? I think the coming decade is really crucial. And there's so many issues that need to be addressed. Foremost, you know, it's global warming and regulating AI so we don't end humanity this century. I mean, you can see it's possible that we could end with the last homo sapiens. And these are like big issues that we need to be addressing and issues that we need to be cooperating on and not viewing everything as zero sum competition. The world is changing and it's changing at such a rapid speed. And we're moving from unipolar into multipolar world. But it's not like going back to the old Cold War, which had a sort of predictability. The economies of America and China are so entwined. You know, many countries in the world, they don't want to have to choose between the US and China. And, you know, you hear developing countries, they're much more concerned about their debt, about adapting to climate change, about financing the green transition about migration. And we're seeing also the rise of middle powers and how, you know, they're not non-aligned, they're becoming multi-aligned. And I suppose I worry that we're going to look back in a few years on Ukraine and wonder how we became so focused on the war 
and lost sight of so many other things happening in the world. And in some ways, it reminds me of that sense of moral certainty we felt in the aftermath of 9-11. We made it feel so ex existential and we felt the world was united. And I think today the world isn't united. Yes, the West has been united around Ukraine. The two thirds of the world live in countries which are either neutral or pro-Russia on this. And it's not because they support Russia, what Russia is doing in Ukraine, but because they're upset with Western hypocrisy. And of course, it's terrible what Putin is doing in Ukraine. And this war is having a huge impact on other countries. I was traveling around Africa last summer, and you're going to see the, the food issues they had there, the food shortages. So I worry how, you know, how the Ukraine war ends, or will it ever end, or will it just become a frozen conflict? And I worry about the future of Russia post Putin. I think that's going to occupy European countries for decades to come. And I am deeply worried about what is happening in the world. So when you think about all of that, um, which is in, in, in previous generations probably the biggest load of, of huge challenges to face. I mean, the world has always been challenging, but this is another level of uncertainty, another level of existential threat. Given everything you've learned about navigating um, these international waters, what do you think the most important set of skills that current and future leaders need to develop to kind of steer us through this into a more you know, stable and positive environment? You know, I always think back to my time working with amazing leaders, in particular, General Odierno, who I worked with during, in Iraq during the surge. And I think what he would do and what he would say. And I feel, you know, very fortunate, really, to have had that opportunity to see good leadership, to see how to lead in circumstances which just seem so desperate. How do you provide a positive vision of things may be hard, but they're not hopeless? How can you find ways ahead? And when I look at him, you know, there's that famous quote from the Iliad, if they ever tell my story, let them say I walked with giants. And I feel with General O oh, that I walked with a giant. I walked with a great man and a great leader. And he had an extraordinary sense of duty. He saw it as a privilege to serve others, a privilege to serve his country. And I think of those terms and I think of politics, politicians today. And I think, do they see it as a privilege to serve? Do they see it as a duty? And when I look at him, he was a leader that you wanted to be on his team. You wanted to be on his team because it was going to be a winning team. And you knew that he would look after you. He would make you feel safe. He was an amazing coach. You know, he believed in us. He encouraged us. He made us all that bit bigger. He made us do things that we never thought we were capable of. He constantly asked questions. He was intellectually curious. He was a good listener. He knew the importance of building up a culture in the organization. What leaders do matters. Organizations take on the personality of their leader. And I think of him as somebody I would have followed to the end of the world, and he would have asked my advice on how to get there. So he made everyone he met feel that they counted, that what they did mattered. 
that they contributed to the mission. And, you know, I learned so much from him about trust, about building teams, about serving something bigger than self. And it was the privilege of a lifetime to serve as his political advisor in Iraq. And when you look at the problems that we face in the world today, we've all got a role to play. You know, you look at climate change and you look at the green transition. We all have to make a little sacrifice on this. We all have to do that for the greater good for future generations. And too often you're not hearing leaders articulate that vision. We don't see enough people who we admire and respect to follow, to want to help them succeed. And these problems that we face are not beyond human ingenuity, but you could say we have a leadership crisis in the world and we don't see necessarily the sorts of people that we need stepping up to lead. I'm glad you said that, um, use the phrase leadership crisis, because we definitely at The Evolving Leader um, feel that's true. And um, it would be really interested to understand what you are doing uh, at Yale to kind of address that, um, because I know you're doing some amazing things. What, what's, what, what are your priorities there? Well, you know, in a university, at one level, I'm involved in teaching students, undergrads and graduate students, to help them better understand the world that we live in to understand how the world is evolving, what went wrong, why sort of America's unipolar moment is ending, what the future holds, what strategies are required to make a positive difference. So there's the teaching aspect. And then there is the leadership center aspect where we advertise, you know, openly for people to apply each year to be Yale World Fellows. We have around two or 3,000 people who apply to be World Fellows. And we choose about, yeah, we choose 16 each year. And these will be people from different disciplines and backgrounds. And we select them based on the character, their achievements, their commitment to making the world a better place. And we bring them together for four months at Yale, where they discuss what is a good society, how do we build it. They share their experiences, their learnings. They get training to develop their communication skills, negotiation skills. They serve as mentors to students, their role models. I think good leaders mentor others and they can give students internships to help them sort of off they go with their careers. We have, you know, a number of other different initiatives that is really sort of sending ripples, we hope, out into the world that using these networks, mobilizing these networks to put some enthusiasm and optimism and hope out into the world. I've got a question around the World Fellows Program, um, but more so in terms of how it's evolving over the course of the last few years. And I'm, I'm just interested, it's, it sounds like something that's been very well established. And I just wonder what you're seeing in terms of the nature of the topics that people are wanting to talk about. You, you talk of you know building the good society. What's the, what's the kind of focus uh, and has that shifted over the last couple of years? I think it has shifted a lot. I think when you look back at the early days, the sorts of people that recruited to be World Fellows were often um, internationals working in international organizations. Now, when you look at the profile of the people coming in, they tend to be people working in their own countries in national organizations or as social entrepreneurs. So there's less a sense of 
there's more agency, if you like, on behalf of people in these countries to make a difference in affecting their own circumstances, their own country, rather than just relying on international organizations. You used to see a much bigger role for things like the United Nations. Today, it plays a much smaller role and national organizations play a much bigger role. And how do you see that those leaders come together and the nature of the conversation change? Because I know that they have to come together for a certain you know, four months, I think, is the, is the work. But what's, the, what's the hope and desire about bringing a mix of different you know, leadership focuses together? I think it gets everybody out of their professional comfort zone, out of their social comfort zone. And you learn that these problems facing the world are complex and you need a systemic approach to addressing them. And they learn from each other. They learn about each other's countries. They see some of the same issues being faced so they can share comparative experience. And they learn that, you know, a good society has includes people with very diverse views, very different backgrounds. And in a way, it generates um, an immense sense of fellowship. People, when they first arrive, they'll be conscious of each other's passport or skin color or accent. And after a week or so, that becomes irrelevant. You can find a way to connect with people if you spend the time getting to know them, listening to their story. So when we start the program, we start with everyone having an hour to talk about what made them who they are today. And later on, they talk about what it is they do professionally and how it contributes to the good society. And the sense of being with people who you're not competing against, you're really helping each other become your best self. To help each other, we have a lot of individual coaching, we have group coaching, how you solicit feedback, how you give feedback, how you make a bigger impact in the world. And there's something, it's always, hard to describe because there's something magical that happens and the people who arrive at the beginning of the semester when you look at their photos at the end of the semester you can see in their faces how much they've changed it's helped them reset what it is to lead a good life how much fellowship and friendship matters and they become accountable in a way to each other. People will set not just goals for their time at Yale, but goals going forward. So they have their own accountability groups. And they can check in on each other and to know wherever they go in the world, they can find a, a Yale world fellow in that place who has been through a similar process, who will, you know, meet them with open arms and knows how to relate and to build friendships and to to make a difference, a positive difference. It's an amazing legacy that you're building there across the world. Um, must be must be incredibly satisfying and fulfilling to, to feel that you're creating those connections. Um, can we just turn um, to a different topic for a moment, which is around the, the growing polarization, particularly in the established economies in the US and Europe and What's your take on that? Is it, is it our political systems that are, are, are failing us? Or is it, wh where is it coming from in your analysis? You know, I find in many ways we went to, you know, we went to Iraq to change it. And then I look about how we became more like Iraq, that we became increasingly polarized. And I think at some level, it's a reflection of a crisis of authority. It's a loss of trust in the state and its capacity to 
maybe moderate different groups. And I think, you know, in Iraq, the invasion brought about state collapse and you had that descent into civil war. In Britain, we've seen growing polarization because of the Iraq war. And then after that, there were 2008 financial crisis and then Brexit. Um, when I look at Iraq, political leaders instrumentalized sectarianism. And we saw a clear link between political tensions and sectarian violence that polarized politics drove insurgencies. And politicians frequently cast their opponents as corrupt and as agents of foreign powers. And the question, you know, was the violence driven top down or bottom up? Was it political elites mobilizing their base by stirring up tensions? Or was it public pressure on political elites to, to create this? And I think it was mostly political elites, although it's a bit of both. And different groups all had their own media channels, all living in their own echo chambers. And you always get extreme views dominating. And this polarization it really shatters the norms of decency, tolerance, moderation that keeps political competition within bounds. And I think it then becomes hard to reverse polarization. Once a society becomes deeply divided, it's difficult to heal. But you have to remind yourself, you know, a place like Iraq, it's always been multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual. People have lived together mostly peacefully through the centuries. When people come into contact with people who are different, it can moderate their views. And agreements between political elites can diffuse tensions. It can establish new norms of conduct, new respect for the rule of law. And I think, you know, I'm saying this about Iraq, but I could be saying all of this about the UK or the US. And this is, it's man-made. It's leaders who have been provoking this. It's leaders who play to extremes. And it's really important to understand the views and perspectives of different sides to understand where people are coming from, not to just listen to channels that tell you exactly what you feel. Listen to things that really provoke different thinking. And I've found in my travels around the world and my travels around the UK, most people actually want the same things in life. They want to get up, go to work, have a job that gives them meaning, have enough money to support their family. Most people are like that. And to try to understand, we've got so much more in common and look for that. And rather than just playing constantly to this or that, always us against them. So polarization is a reflection of our times, but it didn't come from nowhere. I'm really interested in the, the fact that you've, you've managed to take us into a positive, um, optimistic kind of upturn. And um, it can feel a bit bleak at the moment with this set of, um, of fairly uncertain challenges facing us. If you think about how you manage power, how you, you lead in this kind of environment, it, it, is, it is relatively easy to play to the poles of the extremes. Um, because you've got the media supporting you in that process. You've got um, social media as well, um, making that happen, uh, amplifying the, the extremes. And when you see politicians trying to take a moderate line, the media is also complicit in telling you know, the, the population that these people are bland, that they haven't got an opinion, that they are not leading. Um, so what, what is the, you know, in your view, what's the way in which you can lead positively out of this, 
polarization without being accused of not actually having a position on things. Recently, I was visiting Lebanon. I'm on the board of an organization called Manadara, which is set up by a, a Yale World Fellow. And what he tries to do is generate a, a common public sphere. That in the old days, you had a shared public sphere. And what has happened with media and new media, we've all gone into separate public spheres. So he organizes debates on particular themes across the Middle East. And these debates in Lebanon, for instance, all the different channels were showing the same debate at the same time. And that was quite unique. And there'd been this competition around the country of young people to be selected to be one of the debaters. And you could see with clever design, you can actually create that common public sphere. And you've seen people do similar things with citizens' assemblies, where when given the responsibility, ordinary people, selected like you would select juries, can come together to discuss difficult issues and to compromise and not see compromise as a zero sum, but as something that we do for the sake of society. So there are technical things that you can do to enable that. But again, it requires leadership that looks for the greater good, that puts country before party, that puts the future, you know, the future generations at the fore front of, of thinking. Friends, if you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, I encourage you to get a copy of Scott's new book, The Enneagram of Emotional Intelligence, a journey to personal and professional success, where he shares powerful stories and practical tools to help you increase your ability to harness your emotions to understand yourself and others more clearly. It's available online from all major retailers, and there's a link in the show notes. But you were talking earlier about obviously your role as political advisor over in Iraq and um, and it just made me start to question and think about that dynamic between leader and advisor and um, your experience of what almost if leaders today had an advisor next to them, what what is it that they'd be requiring of that advisor? Like what's the how could how can that dynamic play out in a in an everyday scenario? I think Leaders today often do have advisors. We have all these special advisors everywhere you look. But I think, you know, we're living in a world that's becoming increasingly complex. It's increasingly interconnected. It's increasingly unpredictable. So how do you lead organizations in such an environment? And what I saw in Iraq, working, working with a large organization, a large military organization, was the tendency of, you know, the large organization, the large bureaucracy to impose order. We have a plan. We're driving forward the plan. We've got our goals. We need to tr deliver results. So you've got that is your bureaucracy driving order. And yet, you know, you could say, well, that's not the right way. And we had people on the ground who were learning and innovating and being entrepreneurial. And I was kind of in that kind of category, the, the person who says, look, I think there's a different way of doing it. And often you've got the headquarters who doesn't want that. We've got to move forward with, with the plan. And so the challenge for the general or, you know, the minister in, in that case, was how do you encourage and enable that entrepreneurialism while at the same time getting the large operational headquarters to be able to adapt to change and drive forward? So it's steering a big ship. Little things, easy to move around, but it's 
harder to drive that. And so I think, you know, I learned from that experience about, you know, what we'd call today adaptive leadership, the need for bringing in a wide range of perspectives, a diversity of views. You know, we're hung up on diversity all the time at the moment, but that is so much of diversity of skin color rather than people who have really different perspectives. So how do you bring a real diversity of views? And the challenge of making organizations adjust to dealing with uncertainty in order to enable sort of adaptation to occur. And this is really hard because you've got to be decisive. You can't say, I don't know, I can't, don't know, because that paralyzes an organization. So you've got to make decisions, but you've constantly got to be reassessing and evolving and adjusting. And to be able to do that successfully, you've got to have trust. You've got to have a good team working. And you've got to say, look, I really value a genuine diversity of views. And you've got to be able to communicate constantly and openly. And you have to have a vision, a positive vision that, yes, it's tough, but look, together, let's work on developing this shared vision and to create a sense of shared leadership in delivering that vision. We're all bought into it. We're all going to make this work. We've all got a stake in seeing success because it's so important to all of us. That really resonates with both of us, um, I have to say. Um, it might be a difficult question, but I'll ask it anyway. What, who is inspiring you as a leader today? You know, in the old days, I would say <laughs> Nelson Mandela. And, yeah. <laughs> and today, I don't think in you know, the great man in such a way. I think, you know, I'm constantly inspired by Yale World Fellows. I look at James Mwangi. He's a Kenyan who has set up, you know, he's the founder of Climate Action Platform to Africa. Africa that's contributed the least to global warming can actually contribute the most to mitigating to pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And what he is doing is amazing. It's so positive, it's incredible. I look at Sasha Brown, who works for DeepMind. She works on the ethics of AI. And she's there in all those meetings, putting in the guardrails. And I think, I feel so relieved to know that Sasha, who's incredible, is doing that. I look down in Colombia, We've got Claudia Lopez, who is the mayor of Bogota. She's openly gay. She's an incredible leader. And, you know, she's amazing. In India, we've got a policewoman, Rema Rajesh Rajeshwari, hard name for me to pronounce. But Rema is a, police, um, a district police chief, and she's countering disinformation. In Indonesia, we've got Belva Devara, who set up this, it's like a technology enterprise to provide education to millions of young people. And so I think there are people doing great things all over the place. I also, you know, also want to mention we have two world fellows who are prisoners of conscience. In Turkey, we have Hakan Altine. In Russia, we have Alexei Navalny. And I think of their courage and their fortitude in coping with imprisonment. I can hear the passion and excitement in your voice when you're talking about those people. They're clearly very inspiring. What's um, next for you, Emma? What, what's on the horizon of things that you're working on? You know, my centre is quite new. And I really want to build it up. I've just hired three new people. And so the challenge of how to build them, integrate them into the team and to listen to the new ideas that they're bringing and to get their input 
in building the vision. And, you know, the heart of the center is the World Fellows Program, but we've now got a number of other programs. And I'm very excited about the program we have for Climate Fellows, which we launched about a year ago for those working in the global south on how to get to net zero. And this is, you know, this is so important that putting more energy into that, when we advertise to get thousands and thousands of applicants of people from China, through Latin America, through Africa, who are doing amazing things to know that there are people out there so motivated on getting to net zero, that what can we do to help them to build networks we're taking our current climate fellows. We've just been in Paris at the International Energy Agency, and we'll be taking them to COP28 in December. So they get to present to leaders there the things that they're working on. So that's professionally what I've been thinking of. Personally, I really want to improve at tennis and pottery. Those are my things for the next period, and to find a way home back to the UK. I think I've got this, you know, it's like an exile's nostalgia, this yearning for home. And I'm still working out how to get back. It was very hard for me after the Iraq war. I came back to London and I, you know, nobody really wanted to know what I've been doing, where I'd been for the last decade or so. So it was very hard to settle back in. And I think now when I come back, I don't come back as the Iraq person. I'll come back as, you know, the person from Yale who manages these networks of really wonderful people. So I'm looking for that way of how I find my way back to Britain. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that journey. I'm sure that there are going to be many um, open arms uh, to, to bring your wisdom into in, into uh, you know, lots of different domains. So we wish you the best of luck with that. Emma, before we go, is there anything that we haven't talked about that's important to you? I think you've spoken about very many things. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's been an absolute delight. I mean, this has been a very rewarding conversation. I feel like we could, we could talk forever, but um, thank you, Emma, for your insights and for the contribution you're making to the world. So for now, we'll say goodbye. And remember, the world is evolving. Are you?